Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of Space Science with Python. Today is the second so-called concept video about orbital elements or orbits in general. The very first video was about reference frames and sky coordinates and you may recall that in the last videos we had a lot of coding sessions um, to compute the uh, appearance of objects in the sky in ecliptical coordinates, in equatorial coordinates and later we also displayed the horizon depending on the geolocation. But now we would like to go, let's say, deeper into space. We would like to understand the movement of objects and we would also like later to work on, on these objects and, the, and their trajectories. So, of course, we could compute everything with spice. We could compute the XYZ vector and then also the corresponding velocity components. But in space, it's a little bit different. There we talk a little bit about, yeah, not really a vectorial representation of movement but more of an orbital representation and today we will cover what this is all about now orbital elements of course or yeah astrodynamics it's a huge let's say chapter or it's a, it, it can be covered in thousands of lessons uh, even small wikipedia articles here about orbital elements what is all about how to derive it and so on but I don't want to cover all the mathematics today. I would like to really cover the basics so that we can really work with some data next time. So next time we will start working with cometary data, with asteroids, later also meteors and cosmic dust. And for to understand the scientific insights we will generate, we will not need some uh, advanced course about astrodynamics. So let's keep it quite simple. So I'm closing this tab. And let's, let's use a tool that it's quite useful and has been provided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory by NASA. It's a simple orbit visualization tool. And with this orbit visualization tool, I would like to show you <coughs> the different orbital elements that define an orbit and how changing these elements lead to changes in the orbits. And well, this may sound or look a little bit rudimentary and simple, but this is like the very first, let's say, fundament we set. And later with more videos and coding, we will get a deeper understanding when we really will write down functions about other astrodynamical properties. So don't worry, it will be detailed in the future, but this is now a very simple first uh, starting point. Now, this orbit visualization tool is quite simple. We have here something like called orbit controls where we can set different parameters and the resulting result orbit is shown here in an interactive 3D graph. Now, this tool set, I don't know how NASA did it, but this is also one of the future um, tasks we will cover to reproduce or create also a custom orbit visualization tool with Python. So just as a small yeah, teaser, one could create this um, as a, for example, as a Flask application with some input and output uh, fields like here with, the, with some different parameters. And the display or the, the plotting can be then done with some plotting routines like for example, Plotly. And we will do this in the future, but we will not deploy it as an, as an actual web application. It will be more like also a tutorial, a coding tutorial to yeah, reproduce such amazing, amazing tools for our private use. Now, um, let's have a look first in the, at the graph. I have to zoom in before we <coughs> change the orbital elements and see what happens. Now, this is the... 3D plot in ecliptical coordinates of the inner solar system. So we have Mercury, we have Venus, we have the Earth, he has a green orbit, and we have Mars, also with their current position. In the center we have the Sun, and we have a cus user or custom-defined orbit that is here drawn in blue. And it's now yeah, almost identical to Earth's orbit. And the coordinate system itself is given in ecliptical coordinates. So if you recall the, the, the definition that we have the vernal equinox and so on, it's uh, covered in one of the last videos. And the plane here, 
So the, the gray line you can see here is actually the ecliptic plane. So if we have like a side view, we see that all planets are more or less on the same, um, revolving on the same plane. Well, not, not on the same, but plus minus some deviations. The ecliptic plane uh, here in the graph is defined by the Earth and all the other planets have a then a small inclined orbit. But we will get to this in a moment. Now let's zoom out a little bit so everything can be covered on the display. When I change something, yeah, perfect. So <clears throat> we can now change some values and get an idea what these values do. So the very first value is the so-called perihelion distance. So the perihelion distance given here in AU, we can also give it in uh, kilometers, is the distance between the Sun or the barycenter of the solar system and the nearest point of an ob of the object that we yeah, of an object revolving the Sun. So which means that our object here, the blue one, the perihelion, so the closest distance to the Sun is 1 AU. And now we can increase this value or decrease and the orbit will change accordingly. Yeah, you can see here we increase it now to 1.5 or even 2 AU <coughs> and it's increasing and later also I think Jupiter and Saturn will appear so let's maybe choose 7 AU and there we see also Jupiter and Saturn are being added. Yeah, but let's move to the inner part again. So let's choose something like 2 AU. Now you see the um, shape is perfectly circular and you can also see it here on the right side about the orbit details on the right side where we have some more information. And the very first information says, gives, an inform gives some yeah, result about the orbit class and here it says it's perf perfectly circular because the so-called eccentricity is zero. Now what is the eccentricity? The eccentricity is a, is a value, it has no dimensionality, so it's not given in kilometers or degrees or whatsoever. It tells us how circular or elliptical the orbit is. So a value of exactly zero is perfectly, perfectly circular. Between zero and one we have an elliptical orbit the eccentricity equals 1 corresponds to a parabolic orbit and everything that is larger than 1 corresponds to a hyperbolic orbit. So objects that are on a hyperbolic or orbit, they are visiting our yeah, solar system only once and then they are escaping again into the depths of the cosmos. And maybe you recall some objects in the past a few years ago, like for example the um, comet Oumuamua, who was the first, I think it was the first hyperbolic object that visited the solar system with an eccentricity of larger than one. So let's increase the value here. And well, we don't see any major changes now, but if we increase it, for example, to 1.0.2, we see that the shape is getting a little bit more elliptical and if you now exceed it, let's say 0.8, then you see it's not uh, perfectly circular as the planets, it's not really elliptical and it's uh, even yeah, the point that is very far away from the sun, the aphelion, is now close to Uranus. And now with the perihelion and the eccentricity, we can compute as, um, a new value that is not given here, but it's shown on the right-hand side. It's so the so-called semi-major axis, and it says that it's 10 AU. And the semi-major axis is something like, um, yeah, how, how can you say, like the larger radius of of the of the of the of the ellipse. So like the long long axis here and of course this depends on these two values so if I decrease the eccentricity again you will also see that the semi-major axis also decreases accordingly and we will compute this value also in the future so you will see how to do it 
So let's go maybe to a value of 0.6. The third value is now the so-called inclination. So the inclination is, again, we have the ecliptic plane here, and the inclination says, or gives us the value of the tilt or the inclination of the orbit of our of our custom orbit with respect to the ecliptic plane that is defined by the earth so let's increase this value for example to 10 degrees then we see that our orbit is now tilting a little bit and if we if we go a little bit further 30 degrees you see it becomes more and more apparent now, if we are increasing it to 90 degrees, we have something called a polar orbit. So it is crossing like the poles. And then if we go beyond 90 degrees, we get a so-called retrograde orbit. So all orbits here, if you take a look from the top to the bottom, they are moving anti-clockwise. But if our object has like, let's say 170 degrees, then this object here is moving clockwise, so into the other direction. But yeah, again, most objects in our solar system are on, uh, on prograde orbit orbits. In retrograde orbits, we will see there are some certain classes or certain objects, for example, long period comets, where we see also retrograde orbits as well. Now let's move back maybe to 30 degrees and define our orbit now as a um, orbit with five AU semi-major axes. Um, an eccentricity of 0.6, so it's uh, very elliptical, an inclination of 30 degrees. The next value is the so-called longitude of ascending node. Now, what does it mean? Now, we have to, we can orientate our orbit a little bit with respect to the vernal equinox. And the longitude of ascending node tells us what is the angle between the vernal equinox and the point where the object is ascending in the to the let's say ecliptical north pole so if we take a look from the side again our object is revolving it's uh, anti clock yeah it's going down here and at some point it's crossing for, or it's coming from the ecliptical south crossing the ecliptic plane and going to the north and this crossing point of this particular point here this is the longitude of ascending node, and this is the angle between the vernal equinox and this point here. So now the longitude shows into the same direction as the vernal equinox. Now we can increase this value a little bit, and you see that the this orbit is now rotating a little bit, because now we increase the angle between the longitude of ascending node and the vernal equinox. Yeah, let's maybe make it 45 degrees. The last value is now the argument of perihelion. And this is like a similar, um, like, like a, like similarly def defined, but you see here in the small info box, it's the angle between the line of nodes and the line of the apsis. And what is the apsis? So it's the, it's the point here in our case, or the perihelion as the name says, the point where the object has its closest, closest approach to the sun. Now if we increase also this value here, you see that we can now change the position. Oh, let's... Yeah can change the position also now maybe let's increase it maybe to 0.7 so it's a bit more apparent you increase it and you see how now the perihelion changes now so the position of the longitude of ascending nodes remains the same so this did not change so if it changes you see a small rotation of this a uh, dotted line and this solid line here that indicate the um, nodes, the ascending nodes and descending node. So this is here the descending node, the ascending node, but the argument of perihelion shows now the rotation 
with respect to these nodes. Yeah. And that way we can now define any orbit. Yeah, so the orbit is now defined with this five parameters, either with the perihelion or also or, or with the semi-major axis. And if you want to know the location of the object um, or the current position of the object on this orbit, you have to know also other parameters. Here, for example, it's the time of the perihelion passage. So when did the orbit cross the perihe its perihelion in the past? There are also other definitions, uh, like for some angles as well, but here it's like only a time value. Here on the right side, we see some other orbit details. We see um, the date of the perihelion. And our definition was the, um, I think this is the US format, so it's the 5th of January this year. Uh, no, 2020, last year. We have um, the velocity at perihelion, it's 27 um, kilometers per second at the aphelion, so at the point that is far away from the sun, it's 4.8 kilometers per second. And here you have some settings for, uh, for the display. Yeah, so this is basically it, how the um, orbit is defined or how orbits can be defined. Um, the link of this tool is now yeah, is put into the into the description so you can play around a little bit and um, get familiar with the values and so on because in our next tutorial sessions we will cover a lot of topics with orbital elements. Uh, we will use Python all the time of course and this tool shall help you to get a first feeling and understanding how all these things work. Again, you don't need to be an astrophysicist to play around with these things and get a feeling and understanding of it. So I think this is the key message of today's video. And again, with the next videos, we will cover more topics and you will get quite fast familiar with all the uh, other concepts, concepts that follow. This is now the very fundament, the basics, and I hope you learned something today and you are also eager uh, or looking forward to more orbital element videos in the next couple of weeks. Until then, happy coding, happy testing. Um, take care guys and see you next time.